my nerd world. Where's the So last week, I am uh, getting ready for for bed because I go to bed super early because of my regular job, and the news broke about uh, an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, England, uh, where some explosions or an explosion had had gone off, and because I do uh, uh, a news talk show Monday through Friday here in Minneapolis on Twin Cities News Talk, TwinCitiesNewsTalk.com. You know, obviously, I mean, like anybody, but I have to pay special close attention to it. And as we all know, some 22 individuals uh, lost their lives in a terror attack there. I'm not going to get political on this except to, and not even to accept, but I just want to share my story because I saw Depeche Mode at that particular venue. Um, it was then the the Nine X Arena, uh, the largest um, venue in the in that particular area in Manchester. Back in 1998, I had traveled there with my then girlfriend Jennifer because it was on my bucket list. Most of the bands that I really was into at the time in the mid to late 90s hailed from from Manchester or from that region close by. Ned's Atomic Dustbin, um, EMF, Happy Mondays, uh, Jesus Jones. So it was on my bucket list, and I thought, what better place to go and see Depeche Mode in England but to go to Manchester? And we had a, we had a great time. It was a it was an incredibly eye opening experience. I don't remember much of the of the concert in and of itself. We got floor seats, and I told this story in one of the earlier podcasts. We had floor seats for that event, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was super short, and I thought it was great that we were going to have floor seats. But unfortunately, she, she was she was so short. That, you know, she had a hard time seeing over the people in front of her to the stage. I didn't because I'm 6'2". But uh, so I remember during the concert um, feeling bad about the fact that she couldn't uh, she couldn't see the uh, the whole show. I did end up seeing uh, the that same tour when it came to the United States. But, you know, having been there and seeing what took place, it just, um, you know, I mean, it hit home you know at that point in time and the only thing I'll mention about it without getting into any of the of the details of it because I don't want to take time on the podcast too much time I just wanted to point out that I had been to that venue before and for any of us that go to concerts it's unfortunately a reality that we all have to to face now the likelihood of something like that happening to you or to me is very very small but back then when I traveled to Manchester to go to that show that was the last thing on my mind was potential terror attack uh, and it's just it's a it's a strange uh, world that we live in uh, the world we live in in life in general and uh, you know my heart just broke for those concert goers um, especially given the the young age of mo- majority of those the families that were waiting for their daughters to come out of that concert to having been there um, just incredibly incredibly tragic so I wanted to uh, to just take a moment and uh, and mention that and uh, remember uh, uh, just well, you know what? Let's not go there. I just wanted to take a moment and and talk about it and share that with you. So it is episode 15 of the Depeche Mode podcast. I am your host, John Justice. I'm glad you're with us um, again or with me again this week. Thanks, everybody, who um, has the emailed in. We do have some emails to share with you, including something very special from... Um, a friend of the show, uh, John Justice, John J O H N uh, Justice. If you go to, depending on where you download the podcast from, go to Podbean, Podbean.com, search for uh, My Nerd World, John J O N Justice, and make sure you find this week's because um, John put together this amazing Depeche Mode uh, NCAA style bracket. And my plan is that I'm going to wait up, I think I'll wait a week. I want to give you, the listener to the podcast, the opportunity to go and grab that um, that bracket for yourself and fill it out. I haven't quite decided yet how I'm going to 
what I'm going to do. Um, I have filled out my, 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 my bracket, and I am waiting to post it and to talk about it because my intention is over over maybe a full podcast or a series of podcasts to break down my my bracket and how mine ended up. But I thought it would be fun too because, you know, how do you, you know, sort of make a contest out of it? Well, I don't have anything to give away, but I thought it might be fun to give you, the listener, a week to fill out your own bracket and send it to me, and then we can do some comparisons. So almost like my bracket will be the master bracket, and we'll see how many of you came close to what I ended up choosing for for my bracket. And this is all subjective. So there are going to be no right or wrong answers when it comes to filling out your bracket. So we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the show, but um again, go to uh, go to Podbean, uh look for John J O N Justice or my Nerd World there and um basically I put it up as a JPEG that you can go ahead and grab a copy and hopefully, you know, copy, pull up the, the JPEG and then print that off and you can fill out your own and then maybe you can send it uh, back to me. And again, we can we can compare how the brackets turned out. I'm really curious to see what everybody's choices were and how they match up to mine. And thanks again to uh, to John, uh, J-O-H-N Justice, for filling that out. We do have an email from him that we'll talk about a little bit a little bit later on in the show. But again, podbean.com, look for my nerd world or John J O N Justice there and uh, pull up your bracket. John Justice spent a lot of time working on that. And it really is it really is cool. So please uh, please go and uh, go and check that out. All right, there's a brand new article that I wanted to share with you, a Q&A with Dave Gone before we get to uh, this week's topic and your and your emails. Um, this comes out of Forbes.com. Steve Balton, a contributor at Forbes, at uh, at Forbes, had a chance to sit down with Dave, and I wanted to share with you some points from the uh, from the article. Um, let's see. Again, Depeche Mode's Dave Gone opens up about David Bowie enduring four decades and more. Um, in a revealing and very moving conversation, especially when he talked about his love affair with David Bowie's music and how he and the late great rock icon eventually both just became dads at the same school, uh, Gon spoke with Monica uh, Molinaro and I. So Balton asked this, Do you have an even greater appreciation for your fans who've been with you for so long? And when you're older, you also have a different appreciation for everything. And, and Dave said, definitely. I appreciate it a lot more now than I did when I was 25. When you're 25, your whole mindset is just like to get somewhere. And once you realize there's nowhere to go, you've got a reset. This show that we're doing now is just a little over two hours at the moment. We're trying to just make it to or just under. And sometimes songs go a bit longer and you do certain things, but there's something about the pace of it. The set that we're working uh, that we're working with right now, I feel like it actually is working really well. I put it together because I know how it should feel. And I know from experience where a, sh- a song should be or where a song shouldn't be. From old songs to new songs and the ones on the new record that might work live and the ones that uh, definitely won't. There's a lot that you have to think about. You don't really know until you go on stage and actually play the play the set. Look, I thought that was really insightful and cool. Obviously, they put time and effort into it, but this is the kind of stuff that I find fascinating. I would watch endlessly the band looking at their catalog and debating which songs that they were going to play and their rationale for putting them in a particular order. I do the same thing with my weekly radio show when it comes to the topics that I have. I lay them out over the course of three hours and try to create a flow to it. And it's clear that that um, these guys do exactly the same thing. They put a lot of time and energy into picking out the right set. And as I've argued, I think that this year and this tour, it really, really shows. Now, Monica asked, uh, these songs do have a message. It seems like an exciting time, though, as artists try to combat some of the things going on in the uh, in the world today. Uh, Dave says, it's a great time for art, and it's a great time to express yourself. And we're really lucky that we live in a country that we can do that. We're still allowed to do that at the moment. But it's really important to get out and express yourself. We made a record that I think expresses itself in a way that is very thought-provoking as well as moving musically. When I sing these new songs, when we're in rehearsal, I know that they're going to transform once we get on stage in front of an audience and they take on new meetings. Now, Balton asked him, what do these 
songs mean to you? And Dave says when he sings Where's the Revolution, he's asking himself, is it within us, the spiritual thing? It really is. What do we really care about? What do you care about? What do I really care about? And what am I doing to help change that? And I think in my own way, I feel, um, I like to feel that with music and with the band, we help change that. We do something. It's a minute little thing in the scheme of things, but I see people with incredible joy on their faces when we're performing. And I also like to take that into places of darkness and in and out of emotions. And I watch people travel with us because that's what life is. It's all those things. It's fear, it's hope and faith. And at the same time, it's scary and it's joyous. That's what life is. But there's too much of the, of that at the moment that's just BS. And I hope we rise above it. And just a quick point on that. And, you know, Dave, Dave does with his songs on stage and motivation and singing. And I think what a lot of us do when we listen to the music Where's the Revolution has a completely different meaning for me than anything political. I I can take that song and I've morphed it to mean something specific to me with circumstances and situations where Where's the Revolution takes on something completely separate from politics. And again, it just is a tribute to the sort of the genius of Martin Gore's writing. Balton said, um, I saw where you wouldn't call the album political, but to me, the greatest political songwriter of all time is John Lennon because he made his song, his political song so personal. And Dave says, I think for me, it feels like we're at that point again in music and what's popular. Everybody's like, isn't this just a bit thin? Isn't this all like what it is that I'm listening to? I, and I think people want to be moved. They want to feel like something's nudging them in a direction that might be a bit uncomfortable. And I love that. You mentioned John Lennon, one of my all-time favorite artists, says Dave. What he did, quite simply, with just Imagine, for instance, was deeply political. And that was a deeply political song. And at the same time, it was so simplistic. You listen to it and you go, yeah, I should have, I should have wrote that. I should have taken away all this BS and just put it down honestly from my heart, what I would like to see happen. Because that's what people really identify with, a true feeling. And if you can simplify that, and I think if you overcomplicate things and people get confused. Does music have the same effect on you, asked Balton. Now, Dave says, music can change the way my day goes, but there's not a lot else that can. A good movie or something I can walk out from and go, oh, that really moved me. Art does that. That's what's so mind-boggling about the government at the moment. They're so determined to take away from people for some reason. Such as uh, such a small part of what we give, anyways, and it rubs me the wrong way that we don't have enough lawyers. Um, He says, uh, "She asked Molinaro asked, what's a recent example of a song uh, changing your day?" And Dave went on again to talk about um, heroes. So they were rehearsing heroes. We just did it. We went into it. And it was really very moving, and I felt all kinds of stuff. I grew up listening to Bowie, so he's probably one of my favorite artists that I've continued uh, continued to listen to from when I was 12 years old to by the time— and by the time I was 16, and suddenly he was making me not feel like an odd person. Um, Skipping a little bit further in here, my wife came in in the morning and said, I've just heard some news on the radio, and I was like, what? And I just started crying. I'd never done that before. You know, not even to a family member. It was just bizarre. Bizarre. I felt like a big part of me had been pulled out of me. It was weird when he found out that David Bowie had had passed away. All right. They went on to ask. <laughs> there was a great meme going around last year. Bowie passed that uh, after Bowie passed. Um, and everybody passed after him that Bowie was obviously handpicking a new planet. <laughs> and Dave just said, yeah, funny story. I heard Gary Oldman was very close to Bowie, and uh, he said that when he got a call from David, he said, I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is I've got my cheekbones back. The bad news is I've got cancer. I imagine him saying that, but in a very English dry sense of humor. Uh, There's something very, he goes on to say, he still had that sense of humor to do that. Gary said it was heartbreaking, but that was who Bowie was, the man We all thought we knew very well, but kind of didn't really. There's something magical about that. He'll always be in my heart. And if you walk past my dressing room, you'll hear Bowie play usually before the show. And uh, Molinaro asks, that's where it all started with Depeche Mode, right? Um, Dave goes on to say, uh, Martin and I, uh, there are two things we have in common. 
And we both really like T's and we both like Bowie, but somehow we're two oddballs. I sent him something and thanked him for something, and he wrote me back in an email saying, well, I'm so happy the universe somehow came together at some point and the universe pushed us together, so we've got to do this. That was one of the sweetest things Martin's ever said to me. It was very personal, and it was something only Martin could do in an email. He would never do do that to you in person. And the article wraps up with, uh, with this. I interviewed Iggy Pop once, who was saying that all the stuff that kept you apart or kept you fighting goes away. Do you feel that is the case for you guys right now? Uh, we've never been apart, really, Dave says. But we've experienced a lot of stuff as well between us, and externally and separately, and somehow managed to come through it all. And I think um, that we do now appreciate each other, appreciate each other more than what we did, say, 20 years ago, when you're just too young and too stupid. It's all about who's got the biggest dressing room. Why did he get all that stuff? Stupid crap like that gets in the way of being creative. But you don't realize that until you get on stage and you play together. Even if you just had a fight in the dressing room, somehow it all transcends because you realize it's not just about uh, you. Look, you know, I'll soak up any nugget of information that I can get from the band continually. I mean, we still hear about things after reading all the articles and listening to all the interviews. I feel like for some reason, and I was complaining about the fact that we didn't get a documentary, but I feel like for some reason we've actually got more background on the band this time around during the promotion of Spirit and this tour than we have in 10 years. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with Dave Gone doing all these different interviews and providing all this insight. Um, what I really appreciate about what I keep hearing from the band and what I keep hearing from from Dave and from Martin in the interviews is how well they're all getting along and how much they're enjoying the creative process. And it really does lend itself to how great, in my opinion, this album is. They seem like they're in a really, really good place. Now, that also concerns me as a fan because they're in such a good place right now that, again, I can't help but wonder if they decide... <laughs> to call it quits after Spirit is all wrapped up and the tour is over and the Blu-ray for the concert is out. You know, I, I again, the, it seems to be that they're on a path of, if they were to wrap it up, this would be a really, really good time. That being said, I also think there's an argument to be made that there's still a lot of life left in this band and a lot that they could still do as a band, considering where they are, right now i think a lot of that would come down to probably a trimming back on touring if they ended up creating another record and i hope that ends up being the case you know i hope we get more music and a couple more albums and that the band decides that they can still create music but they can't but they're not going to put themselves through the rigors of massive world tours as long as we still get amazing depeche Mode music i would be absolutely fine with that All right, for the next portion of the podcast uh, this week, you know, I wanted to focus on on this. And I'm trying to think of how – well, that was funny, and I know how it came up. I was listening to, to, to some Depeche, and I had, I had my iPod on shuffle. And Stories of Old came on. And I know the band has gone back and revisited Stories of Old from Some Great Reward. Um, they did a, um, a stripped-down version that was awesome – on the documentary for, for Sounds of the Universe. But that got me thinking about sort of this quirky side of the band. And non-singles that had the biggest impact on you, the hardcore fan. What are the oddball Depeche Mode tracks that you love? That to me really separate out the hardcore fans from the casual fan. Look, there's a difference. I mean, all bands have this, but there's a difference in the singles that get released versus the album tracks. And I like a lot of a lot of Depeche Mode's music and some of the quirkier items. And sort of working in reverse, Scum would fall into that category for me. Scum seems like this album's sort of oddball, um, oddball track. Whereas you listen to Delta Machine and My Little Universe was that album's sort of oddball track. I didn't particularly care for that song, but there are a number of non-single songs that, to me, I absolutely, I absolutely adore. So email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and it's available, that email's available in the notes for the podcast. 
but email me and let me know what are the, what are the non-single and we'll say quirky like off the beaten path the, the the songs where the band really did something different and and stepped out um and and just created a different you know a different sound i mean every single album has it and so i'll give you just a few of mine i just i grabbed a pen and just jotted down um so stories of old is the one that obviously reminded me of that i mean that's a it gets a bit i love that song don't get me wrong um very storytelly but i just i love that song uh get right with me off of uh, songs of faith and devotion one of my all-time favorite songs, and if you look at my iTunes playlist, you'll see that one has had a lot of repeated plays. Uh, to Have and to Hold, off of Music for the Masses. Uh, sometimes, off of Black Celebration. Absolutely love that song. Um, I Am You from Exciter. That song, to me, is one of the most underrated tracks uh, by Depeche if not the most underrated ch- track, I absolutely love that song. We'll talk B sides on an, on another podcast because I'd love to get your thoughts on B sides. And if you want to send in uh, when you email about sort of your non single album favorite tracks, if you want to put in your B sides too, feel free, and then I'll have them for uh, for other podcasts. Because in my mind, like Ghost and Light. Some of the uh, throwaways from uh, Sounds of the Universe. Both of those songs should have been on the album as far as I'm concerned. My Joy from the Songs of Faith and Devotion era. Ah, I love that song. And now I'm talking B-sides I don't want to. So, again, email me your non-single album tracks, your favorite ones. Uh, ones that that most of the casual fans would never, would never know. And uh, if you want to include B-sides in there, feel free. You know, and, and, and the way that I had worded this in the notes for the podcast were the, the non-singles that had the biggest impact on the hardcore fan. Because that, to me, is a big part of of the hardcore fandom of Depeche Mode, is that it's not just the singles. You hand somebody a singles collection, and then you give them an album to listen to. And you could say that with a lot of bands, but for Depeche Mode, I think that it rings true even more so than a lot of bands. Their non-singles tend to sound very, very different, even attached to an album that has, as a whole, a very specific feel to it, like Spirit or like Violator or, you know, Songs of Faith and Devotion. So again, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and I look forward to covering that on next week's show. All right, speaking of talkshownerd at gmail.com, let's move over to the email portion of uh, this week's show. Um, out of Melbourne, Australia, thanks again to Shane uh, Perry for uh, from The Goddess for dropping me an email. Uh, he had a suggestion for this week's show. Uh, maybe you could broach the subject of Martin only finding out about 15 years ago that his real dad was African American due to his mom meeting him when he was a sailor. This explains his wild curly hair and my theory, as un-PC as this sounds, that this is where Depeche Mode might get their soul, exclamation point. And maybe it's cliché to say, but hearing songs like Goodnight Lovers, I can't help but think that is the case. Just an idea. Uh, thanks once again, John. Looking forward to the next installment. All right, let's get into this. First off, has it only been 15 years since Martin Gore found that out? I mean, maybe so. I remember just knowing that piece of information that he had a uh, that he had an African American father for as long as I could. Maybe it was 15 years ago. I don't know, but I remember. I mean, I just know that I've known that for a long, long time. Look, I, I don't think it's it's unpolitically correct or politically incorrect to talk about the fact that um, Martin Gore is mixed race and the the influence that I might have had on him. I, I don't think it would be in terms of – I don't think it would be specifically because of genetics, though. And what I mean by that is I think that it – if he does, I mean, he may have gravitated towards that, finding out about his about his father's background and music that his dad might have been into. I mean, look I, look, I grew up listening to a lot of bizarro jazz that my father listened to, and I don't have any doubt that while I'm not a big fan of jazz – there is an element of jazz that I find in music that I like that I gravitate towards. And that's why even going back to the topic a moment ago of the quirkiness that Depeche Mode has on particular songs on their records, I think a part of that comes back to 
my listening to jazz and how random jazz can be. Um, Scum, and I'll bring it up again, Scum from Delta Machine isn't jazz, but it has that sort of free-flowing vibe to it where it's a little bit disjointed. It feels a little bit different. So I don't have any doubt that Martin Gore was influenced by blues. We know that. I mean, you go back and watch 101 when they're in that um, when they're in that record shop in Nashville, and they're looking for Roy Orbison and and some of uh, his influences, especially on 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 his on his solo records. Uh, whether or not that has to do, has to do with the fact that he knows about his his father's background being an African American, I, I I don't know. Could or he could just be a fan of you know soul music. All right, let's move over to uh, Ian. Uh, Ian dropped an email this week. Uh, was worried where I was, and so again, every the show will be out every Sunday from here on out. Wanted to add my bit on Dave's performance. As I've mentioned before, being a few years older, I was lucky enough to see them for the broken frame onwards. And back in those days, Dave's knees seemed to be stuck together for most of the show. During the construction time again and some great reward, he developed into an incredible front man, a front man being able to hold the audience in his hands the whole time. He peaked during Black Celebration music, music for the Masses and Violator. And despite being in a bad way, master of the understatement during Songs of Faith and Devotion, he still did an amazing show. Absolutely agreed. After his rehab, uh, the singles tour, Dave was back to his old self, perhaps lacking a bit of energy, but still better than 90% of the band's other, of other band's frontmen. Absolutely agree. It was the Exciter tour where I remember reading an interview with him, and he said that he was going to present himself in a different way. And that was the start of the Dave Gone pump, pub singer phase, which he's done for every tour since then. I don't think his vocals on the tour are back to holding a note rather than singing through his nose, but he now has adopted a walk around the stage pretending to be a chicken, which is slightly disappointing. Yeah, you've laid it out better than I did on last week's show. Um, you absolutely did, and you're you're right. I totally agree. We must remember that Dave is 55 now and probably won't be doing the high kicks he did in the 20s and 30s again, but I do wish he would just turn down the sleazy man on stage a notch or two. I also wish he would shave his stubble as well. <laughs> if I look like Dave when I'm 55, I will be very happy. But the three-day stubble just makes him look plain dirty and not in a good way. You know, it's really funny because I absolutely agree with you. And I, I doubt the band knows it. And Dave can obviously perform and, and, and grow out as much facial hair as he wants to. But I don't begrudge any fan you or me or anybody else listening to the show that focuses on Dave's appearance or the band's appearance because we all look at Depeche Mode as something that's beyond just the music. The music gets its core, but it's a total package. It is a mindset to a certain extent, but it's a lifestyle. It is a style. And Dave now doesn't really fit the Dave that we knew back then. Stubble Dave fits Dave now and that sleazy sort of stinger singer more so than he did back then. So I guess what I'm trying to say is Dave Gone's going to be Dave Gone. And I love the dude regardless. I do agree with you. I wish he would go back to, I wish he toned down a bit of the sleazy stage singer, you know, sleazy man on stage, shave the, shave the goatee. But at the same time, he needs to do what's most authentic for him. And I imagine... And again, email if you'd like, talkshownerd at gmail.com. I imagine for for you and for me that don't particularly care for this style, Dave, there are probably a lot of fans out there that prefer this style, Dave, over the Dave that we had um, right up until, say, the, the devotional tour. I do wish that he would turn on the live shows. I wish that he would bring more out in terms of emotion and depth to the song like he used to and less of the onstage antics. I know that wouldn't lend itself to arenas or the most exciting show, but go back and watch 101 and look at how angry he was between some of the songs and his mic being away from his mouth and him yelling at the crowd even though they couldn't tell what they were saying. I mean, he was pouring his heart and soul into those shows. And it's not to say that he's not now, but it is teetering on parody. It's not there yet, but it is teetering on parody. All right, getting back to his email. 
Um, saying that, though, I love Dave. I love the band, and I would rather have Dave uh, in any stage or stage performance than not at all. I don't think this uh, will be the last album. I don't think this will be the last tour either. Dave said in a recent interview um, with uh, Ricky Gervais, he thinks, that uh, what else would I do? I think DM is so in his blood that they would struggle to stop. And look, man, I hope you're right. I really do. And I hope, as I suggested in a previous show, I hope they go back and do something different on the next album. I hope they try to, I would love them to go back and try to recapture that that Violator era. Man, there's just something about that album. I was listening to it again the other day and and just taking a break from Spirit. And there is just, there is just so much depth in that album. I mean, Songs of Faith and Devotion too, but there's just something so special about Violator, in my opinion. So uh, thank you for the email. Let's go to our last email this week. And it does come from John Justice, uh, J-O-H-N, who I mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, He writes, did I blow your mind with that bracket? This is the bracket that he made that, again, I want you to go and grab the JPEG and print it up and fill it out yourself. And hopefully you can send it back to me. Um, He says he didn't rank the first 32 slots personally. He took them off the web. So the first one through eight seeds came straight from someone's view of the Depeche Mode's best songs. The final 32 or 33 to 64 were a mixture from another list and some personal favorites. Although, as I said, I know I left some good ones out. I kind of like uh, the bracket, but feel free to change it if you feel necessary. Uh, he attached a PDF version for me if I wanted to post it, but I haven't quite figured out a way to do that with the... Um, with the uh, pod bean, which is why I ended up going the route of putting the uh, the JPEG up. No, man, look, I think it's fantastic. And I would encourage everybody um, to go grab the JPEG, fill it out, and send it back. I filled mine out, but I'm waiting to share it with you. And we can spend maybe the next, pot, the, the next show or the next few shows going through each of the brackets. And I'm really curious to see where, again, you as the fan ended up landing – and where we all kind of compare in our in our choices, because it's obviously um, so, so uh, selective. So, again, um, it is available at Podbean, podbean.com. Uh, you can go and on uh, on episode 15, this week's show, you can go and grab that and uh, fill it out. And hopefully we can have some fun with it on uh, next week's show. So that wraps up um, episode 15 of uh, Depeche Mode, the podcast. I know that I'm ending it a little bit early uh, this week. I'm really, really short on time today. And it was either I didn't get a podcast out this week uh, or I didn't get one out today um, or I got one out today and it was shorter. And I wanted to make sure that I got a show out today. So that's why this is about... uh, uh, a good 15 minutes shorter than what we normally get. It will be back to uh, full strength next week, I do promise, though. Thank you so much for downloading episode 15. I hope you have a fantastic week. If you're here in the States, I hope you have a great Memorial Day as we remember those who uh, gave the ultimate uh, sacrifice. And uh, hopefully everybody has a fantastic uh, holiday. Again, drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Really want to hear your uh, your favorite and your biggest non-single songs that impacted you as a hardcore fan. Also, B-sides for later podcasts. And go to Podbean, J-O-N Justice, My Nerd World, and grab that bracket that a friend of the show, John Justice, created. Have yourself a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. My Nerd World.